Good afternoon. This is ISIS. Please sign the blue sheets. So we need, who would like to take minutes? I heard. <laughs> Is that AC? Is he signing up for AC's it? hiding. AC, where are you hiding? Yeah, here comes the minute. <laughs> <laughs> our try, our tried and these doors are blocked. I thought they'd be open. We were on the wall. Us, maybe it's over there too. Okay. Uh, do does anybody want to be a jabber scribe? No, no jabber scribes. I just have one thing. I mean, you can grab one of your powers if I get too long. Uh, that that would be fine. You, you can actually probably grab it now if you'd like. I'm at 30% or 30-some percent, but I don't know how long this is going to be. Okay, so uh, here's the note well. Are we supposed to read this? I heard where. I think everyone can read this, uh, but I think I'm also supposed to read it out loud now. But, oh, well that, that's a problem. Which one knows to? Here we come. All right, so there's the note well. Um, by participating with the IETF, you agree to follow IETF processes and policies. If you are aware that any contribution, something written, said, or discussed in any IETF context is covered by patents or patent applications, you must disclose the fact or not participate in the discussion. You understand that the meetings might be recorded or broadcast, audio or video, photographed, and publicly archived. And for further information, go to one of those. So um, this is our agenda, um, and this is an opportunity to change things. No changes? All right, well then let's go through the document status. We had a lot of new RFC since we last met, uh, since we didn't meet in Buenos Aires. You can see there. We have two that uh, we've submitted to the IESG, the remaining lifetime fix, and um, the IPv6 router, uh, router ID fix. Um, we also have some new working group documents. Uh, these were, uh, well, the L2 bundles, we're, we're hoping to kind of push through quickly because we didn't meet in Buenos Aires. Uh, we'll, Les will be presenting the MI change today, uh, and we'll also see a presentation on the autoconf from Bing. Oh. Uh, Les Ginsburg, did we not move L2 bundles past last call already? Uh, Hannes Pending doing the Shepard report. Right, right. But the, So this is not a new working group document. Uh, it, it's actually on my to-do list to submit to IS okay. for publication. Just, so, so, yeah, so this that's an interesting thing, um, Les. I use this tool that I wrote, right, that basically goes back and looks at 
when the document was published compared to the last time we met. <laughs> so yes, you're right, but it's also, it was a new working group document since the last time we met too. That's, that's why it showed up in that column. Exactly. So, so it compares it to IETF 94 and, it, and that was the time period that it, anyway, that is confusing. I agree. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Precisely. Reliable diffs. <laughs> uh, these, are, these are the up, uh, updated working group documents. Uh, the only one that we're seeing a presentation on today would be the segment routing extensions by S Stefano. Um, the Yang, do, do we know what's holding up Yang now? Is it just waiting for the op state? Or the, oh, you know what, it's waiting for the routing config, right? AC Linda. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I guess it is on Cisco Systems. I'm I'm on the I'm on on the drafter. Uh Stefan Stefan uh, Litikowski's the editor. And I think we're sort of waiting to we were waiting for the op state. Now I was gonna talk to Stefan about it. He's not here, this IETF, so we'll have to email. But we have uh bi weekly uh uh meetings on that draft that we haven't had for, for about Oh, a couple months now, and I think we should have one and 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 discuss what we have left to do. But feature-wise, I think it's at a at a it's got more than ex, you know it's more than what the MIB has. So right or any MIB and everything. I think it's I think it's ready. Okay. I, I can give a little update on the ISI SMRT draft there. Um, Chris who Chris are Bowers, you? and uh, so. The, the basic stuff related to MRT, we believe, is, is pretty much ready. Uh, however, Stuart Bryant proposed actually moving the, there's part of it that isn't just MRT specific, it's con a controlled convergence timer, basically, that's applicable to other things aside from MRT. And uh, he actually has a draft from several years ago that, that discusses this. Uh, and we think for general, for reasons of general visibility, it would be better to just move this out to a, to a different draft which at this point, I think we're thinking about putting in the routing area working group um, and having it be sort of a joint routing area ISI, so SPF single draft that we sort of adopt and work and last call across all three because it's a very simple concept. So just a, that's the general idea we're looking at, but that new draft has not yet been created. Yeah, that's, so there is a controlled convergence uh, timer value in both the ISIS MRT draft and the OSPF MRT draft, which uh, we included in there because MRT can make use of it. However, it's something that other uh, so loop avoidance techniques can make use of as well. And so it it's better, I think, for visibility that it isn't buried within a an MRT draft or within the two MRT drafts and uh, we think it'll get better review just by being out on its own. Right, okay. All right, and we have uh, some new uh, IDs. We have three of them being presented today. So we've, the same, the same thing applies there where we have Gravity prefix SID in version two since the last time we met. Uh, so, Alia asked us to, we weren't going to publish this, uh, this, this uh, problem statement draft was the one that led to the solutions draft. Um, and there's, basically the decision was to just incorporate whatever we needed from that into the solutions draft. And so this one didn't get published, but Alia thought that we should put, a, put out a public thank you for the work, so I would like to do that here and also later on the list. But thank you, Bruno and Christoph. Anything? All right, well then uh, let's start with the first presentation, which I believe is Les. This is going to be somewhat challenging. Can it get bigger? It's just, yeah. 
Okay, I'm Les Ginsberg. Um, this is actually the first presentation of this draft, um, partially because we did not meet in Buenos Aires. And we actually wrote the draft, uh, I think, shortly after Yokohama. But the draft has actually progressed uh, pretty quickly. Um, next slide. So we wrote this originally in December of last year. Um, and there was, since there was no meeting in Buenos Aires, it wasn't presented. Um, but there was, uh, from the discussion on the list, we proceeded to make it a working group document. Um, and uh, that's where we stand today. Next. So the motivation for this, um, MI was originally defined in RFC 6822, and we prohibited the use of RFC 5120-style MT in a non-zero instance. But from some deployment uh, requests, we had some customers who wanted to be able to use MI in combination with uh, RFC 5120-style MT. And so we decided to take on the task of uh, modifying uh, 6822 to allow that under limited circumstances. Next slide. So just a quick reminder for a, a non-zero instance, there is an IDTLV in the various PDUs and HELOs and LSPs and SNPs, and it looks like this. Um, it has a list of uh, the, there are, uh, instance-specific topology IDs that are supported, uh, and you could have multiple of these. Um, they are not to be confused with the RFC 5120 empty IDs. They're not the same thing. Next slide. So, as I said, in 6822, we prohibited the use of RFC 5120-style uh, empty IDs in a non-zero instance. We have now made exception to that, and um, there, these are some of the changes in the draft. Basically what we said is, if you're using ITID zero in a non-zero instance, so you have an IID which is non-zero, and then you have a set of supported topologies which can range from zero to 65,000. We, we have reserved ITID zero for special use, and we're saying, if you're only supporting ITID zero, then you can use RFC 5120 style MTIDs in that non-zero instance. So um, you can read the draft, um, but these are the changes to the RFC 6822 text that allow this. Uh, next slide. So yeah, this is just more of the language that was changed to, to make this legal. Next slide. This change is not backwards compatible. And we asked, um, I think even back in Yokohama before the draft was actually written, because we knew we were going to write it, we asked if there were any implementations out there that would have issues if we made this non-backwards compatible change. To date, no one has come forward to say that they are going to have issues. Uh, in the meantime, we have gone forward. There are now two implementations of this draft, and there has been interoperability testing between the two. Um, so we've actually demonstrated that this works. Next slide. OK, there were a few other changes that we introduced because there, were, uh, there was a, a suggestion um, that the, uh, this is where it's hard to read, um, that the IID TLV, uh, it would be nice if the IID TLV was the first TLV in the PDU, so that if you're parsing the uh, PDU and you're trying to figure out which instance it's associated with, you find it more quickly. So we put a suggestion, this is a should, not a must. Um, so if you're receiving, you still have to keep looking until you decide you can't find it, but Hopefully, most of the implementations will make it easy. Um, there were um, three erratas filed against 6822. 
So we took this opportunity to address uh, those erratas that we thought were appropriate. Um, the first one clarified that uh, the IID TLV is only included in uh, point to point hellos or point to yeah, point to point hellos associated with a non zero instance. Um, that was uh, one of the erratas that was filed. Uh, the second one. Uh, sorry, I can't read. <laughs> Yeah, so this is, we on, on broadcast interfaces, we use a different MAC multicast address for the non-zero instances to make sure that they're not actually received and misinterpreted by the legacy instances. Um, so there was some clarification requested that to, to state that these uh, MAC multicast addresses uh, are only used in sending PDUs on a broadcast interface. And next slide. There was another errata filed that suggested that uh, we needed further clarification um, that, uh, sorry, I don't have this memory. Oh, oh, thank you. Does that help at all? Yeah, so um, on a on a point-to-point -point interface, you don't know if you support uh, non-zero instances. When you first come up, you don't know whether your neighbor on the the point-to-point -point interfaces supports non-zero instances or not. Um, if he does not, and you send uh, PDUs with non-zero instances, he will misinterpret them as belonging to the legacy instance. And so there's, there's text in the RFC that says um, you shouldn't be doing this on point-to-point -point interfaces unless you know that the neighbor actually supports the non-zero instances. There was an errata file suggesting this was unclear in terms of running in point-to-point -point mode on broadcast interfaces. Uh, we considered this and we feel that the language in the RFC is, is adequate. There is a separate section on broadcast interfaces that discusses how to, how to run point-to-point -point mode on a broadcast interface. So we did not make any changes for this. Next. So given that we actually have um, two working implementations, um, we feel this is when we've not actually received any comments. So we feel this is ready for last call. That's it. Opinions? So, so um, the interrupt, the, sort of the backward compatibility thing is sort of interesting because the one of the things, that, one of the vendors that was interrupting was had implemented it with MIMT all along. So, so I mean, the, the, it's just a point of reference that we're not going and breaking necessarily breaking things. One of the deployed versions was already quote broken. But now it won't be. Um, so the, who, the, the, the owner of that implementation might use different language, however. Yeah. So, so who, the, who thinks this is uh, ready for a uh, working group last call or, well, yeah. Yeah, so we, we've got, a, and, and I assume most of these people have read it, too. Okay. So I think that we'll take that to the list, but it, does anybody object to it? And then that would be no one in the room. All right, thanks, Les. Who's up next? Is it autocomplete? Did you have the... Oh, it's going to happen anyway. Good afternoon. This is Bing Liu. It's an update of the SIS auto configuration. Next, please. Uh, this draft was adopted after the Yokohama meeting in ITF 94. And uh, um, the 01 version is only a keep alive update. So 
some there are some revision in this latest zero two version, and a couple of technical revision, and as well as um, a throughout editorial revision. Next, please. The technical revision. The first one we deleted a, a technical requirement that uh, it is in the as as default configuration, the auto config should allow P2P mod uh, on Ethernet interfaces. We thought uh, it is something that not very necessary, but introduce uh, complexity. So we just delete this requirement. The next one is a very small one. We clearly spe specify the rotor fingerprint comparison uh, need to do oct by oct and uh, uh, starts from the left. Uh, this is very, uh, very small specification. And also the padding um, is also start from left. And I, I'm sorry, the slides uh, should right side. Uh, it is a typo. Uh, in the graph, it is from left side. Sorry about that. And the last one is the dynamic host name. Um, we add a bit um, to guarantee the uniqueness. So it should append the um, system ID as a suffix of the uh, host name. Okay, this is the technical revision. And there are some uh, open questions. The first one, uh, in current document, we specify that uh, um, at the star bar mode. Yes, Ian? Um, do you want to finish describing this first and then I'll, I'll ask my uh, question? Uh, you, you first. Okay, me first. So Ian Farah. Um, so the, um, I originally, um, I'm one of the co-authors on this draft and I originally raised this question when I was doing the review before this update. Um, I think I slightly badly described the question when I put it to the other authors actually because I, I mean the one minute, fine, 30 seconds, whatever, whatever's um, uh, most appropriate there. I don't think that's the important thing. The, the question that the text um, raised in my mind is how do you know whether you've synchronized with all of your net, uh, your neighbors because if you're on a um, uh, an Ethernet segment say and you know I, the, the home net kind of use case that you may have many other um, ISs that you're talking to there how do you know after one minute that you have spoken to all of these neighbors and how can you actually say this has been completed or, or one minute has elapsed mm -hmm. And that, that's the thing that I, I don't think the text, you know, really, really solves as it stands at the moment. Yes. Um, um, for the scenarios like uh, home and the very small enterprise, I believe the uh, one minute should be uh, reasonable, but uh, I agree it is not a, a comprehensive um, time, uh, especially uh, in case it is used by some large scale network. Uh, so me too also has some concern of the specific uh, time. As, as a suggestion, you might want to consider to measure actually the LSP arrival and LSP transmit rate uh, and see once those is tapering off after, you know, one per 10 seconds or so. Uh, that's usually a good enough heuristics for declaring uh, synchronization completion. Mm -hmm. um, Wes Ginsburg, the, the problem is not determining LSP DB synchronization because that is deterministic. You know, you, you exchange CSNPs and or you get CSNPs from the DIS and so you know what the full set is and you can figure out when you get them all. The, the part that's potentially indeterminate is how long do you wait before you've decided you've discovered all your neighbors? Yeah, and so, uh, and this is also, I mean, this is only for duplicate detection, right? I mean, you're picking, uh, you're picking some SysID, you're going to grab your Mac, you're going to hope that it doesn't clash with anyone else and that all this waiting around and, and waiting for synchronization is to try to be relatively sure that that, that you haven't, is that, is that correct? Um, as I understand this, uh, not for the um, 
duplication is for the startup mode uh, to avoid some unnecessary uh, collision uh, duplication processing uh, before the uh, the network is um, stable so uh, it, it is a, a common behavior once the node joined in the network as a new node and it must uh, wait for some time not only for the duplication process and the second open question is um, we are considered to change the shoot to must uh, when duplication detection um, uh, was was done and uh, the node get a new uh, system ID then it must uh, repeat the, the the process again so because we cannot figure out uh, an exception that uh, it doesn't need. So we think maybe a stronger must is uh, uh, better than should. Next, please. So next step, we clear the open issues and uh, we need a more review, especially throughout review, uh, both uh, editorial issues and uh, technical issues. And if there's no significant new issues found, I would like to um, request a last call later. Yeah. Right, so we, so that would happen on the list after these steps. Okay. Uh, I did notice um, in my, when I reviewed the latest version that, that in the uh, double duplicate detection, there was a TBD. Um, I think Ian told me that that might have been removed in a version that you guys yes. were working on, but. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thanks. So, next one is Mac. This one, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. This is Mark Chen. I'm printing this um, big update to the ISS extension for Interest TE. Uh, uh, actually, this draft is published as a um, second RFC. Uh, and after the uh, routing error uh, this section, uh, the general work is moved to the TS working group. So, uh, our, the first version of the draft is submitted to that working group. And based on the agreement between uh, among the uh, both working group chairs and co-authors, the draft is moved to this working group. And that's the history about the draft. Mm. So next slide, please. So the problem that the draft trying to draw uh, is that uh, in the in our in our working office, there's a interest TRV. Uh, uh, it defends the uh, four octets uh, route ID. Um, this ID uh, is used to uh, to indicate the source of the TRV, but uh, the RC does not specify how to fill the fields uh, when there is no four octets uh, router ID is assigned, and uh, if there's if the load does not support IPv4. And another issue the draft is not clear is that the RC does not clear on on the re relationship between this ID router ID and the T router ID that is defined in RFC. Uh, 5305. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, in this update, so we add a new sub TRV to the interest uh, TRV that is used to uh, carry the uh, IPv6 raw ID if the load does not support uh, IPv4 or if the load does not ha uh, is not assigned uh, IPv. IPv4 uh, router ID. Next slide. So this is the new text that's made to this uh, piece uh, draft. Uh, the, the, first, uh, in the first part in red, uh, in red is to clarify uh, the, the relationship between uh, the T router ID and the router ID in this draft. 
uh, in the tr uh, we that is that the raw ID should be identical to the uh, T raw ID uh, advertised in uh, as uh, as defined in RFC uh, fifty three zero five, and uh, the second part in, in red is to uh, to specify how to uh, fit the raw ID field if there is no uh, IPv four uh, uh, raw ID, no matter what it is not support or uh, there is no IPv four uh, raw ID assigned. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, I think that's all. It's some very minor update to this uh, RFC, and this and, and actually this a uh, uh, par parallel draft that's already in the past. The working group last call. <laughs> this draft is a little bit late. Yeah, that's all. When you say parallel, you mean the one that we've submitted to the ISG with the IPv6? Yes, the R, uh, oh, okay. R, mm, 49, 17, 1, I think. Right. Yes. Uh, does anybody have a, any objections to it? It says working group adoption. It's, it's sort of interesting, the working group adoption, because I think we're taking the, the draft away from CCAMP. I guess that's the only interesting thing about that. Uh, does anybody object to doing this? All right. Um, I, I think that we should probably um, go pretty quick on this one. Okay, but sure. Thank we, you. We'll take it to the list. Okay, thank you. Next one is Stefano. Okay. Yep. Hi, I'm Stefano Gravidi from Cisco. Oops. So a short update on the segment routing extensions. Next slide, please. So uh, it's a long time since we met, I think, on the segment routing. So in version four, we added the uh, multi-topology binding TLB because the first instantiation of the binding TLB in ISIS was not uh, multi-topology aware. And we added some text on the encoding of the sRGB inside the segment routing capability. I think at the time the change was the ability to encode multiple sRGB ranges within the same uh, SR capability TLB, uh, something like this. Next. Version five, uh, quite a few texts has been added uh, in uh, clarification of the setting of different flags, especially the attached flag on the binding TLV. The binding TLV is used to propagate, to advertise binding between prefixes and SIDs. So it can be done by a router that is not the owner of the prefix advertising the binding. So that, I mean, that's called the mapping server. The mapping server doesn't really know if the uh, originator of the prefix is really where the prefix is attached. But if it happens to know it, it sets the attach bit so that the receiver of the binding TLV can assume uh, the PHP uh, behavior for that, for that prefix. Uh, we made the point very clear in the ISIS specification. Uh, the mechanism through which the mapping server may know if a prefix is attached or not is out of scope and we're not going to find a way to, to describe this. In other words, if you are in the same level, you receive a prefix advertisement. The prefix advertisement may have the prefix attributes. Among those prefix attributes, you have the the flags that tells you that the prefix is local. In that case, when you receive a binding advertisement for that prefix, you know that you can do uh, PHP, if you are obviously the penultimate hub before that prefix. Uh, we also added and a little bit restructured the text around the different flags that we have on the segment routing capability sub TLV, especially related to the data planes. So we have the I, V, and H flags, two flags for the MPLS data plane, MPLS with IPv4 control plane, MPLS with IPv6 control plane, and the H flag is the IPv6 both control and data planes. 
we also put some text on the restart and the srgb advertisement mm -hmm. with i think a should where we say that it would be good if you re-advertise the same ranges after restarts. And finally, we introduced the notion of a different algorithm than uh, algorithm zero, which is SPF. We defined a strict SPF algorithm. Next, version six, we just moved away. I wish I could say all, but I can just say most of the issues related to uh, conflicts in terms of uh, binding advertisement because all those conflicts are addressed or we are trying to address them into the conflict resolution draft in spring and and so there is no need to put any uh, and i mean to describe any behavior into the protocol specification or spf or sas so that's why we cleaned up a bit the draft but still i think we have a couple of places in the in the draft, especially in section 2.1, the prefix it sub TLV section, where we still make uh, a statement about the priority of a prefix seed versus a binding seed. And this will have to be clarified once the conflict resolution draft will come to a consensus. Otherwise, uh, this is pointless. Next, version 7, that was an easy one, just a refresh. Next, so version 7 is the one that is actually uh, <coughs> the latest one. Now, there is something that we may want to address. I, I, I'd really like to address that. Uh, there is some confusing text about the use and the advertisement, the reception of the SR algorithm sub TLV. The current text says that the uh, SR algorithm sub TLV is optional so you may want to advertise or you may also not to advertise it says that if you advertise the sr algorithm sub tlv you must advertise algorithm zero uh, looking to less just to be sure i'm not saying wrong thing right okay <laughs> so uh, stating that a tlv is optional but if you have if you send it it must contain algorithm zero it's not very clear so it looks like that if you want to support algorithm zero you have two ways either you don't advertise anything uh, either you advertise and you must put algorithm zero so in other words if you do advertise the sr algorithm tlv and you forget to insert algorithm zero inside it it's like you do not support segment running at all uh, so it's not very clear and also, again, in, uh, in section 2.1, the prefix it's a PLV uh, section, it is stated that all prefixes that are part of the shoulder spa tree, so for which the, uh, the, 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 the path has been computed using SPF, must have algorithm zero. So all these texts, uh, despite the fact that, I mean, what we want to say is that we have algorithm zero that corresponds to the default way of computing uh, reachability into ISIS. And if you advertise SAIDs with algorithm zero, you're supposed to support algorithm zero. Since algorithm zero means SPF, which is the base algorithm for ISIS for the last 35 years and something, uh, shouldn't we say that algorithm zero is just assumed to be supported by default? I think that any implementation of ISIS today does support SPF, otherwise what else would you support? Now, we could just clean up the text and say, okay, from now on, the advertisement of uh, algorithm zero, it's optional because it is assumed to be supported in all cases. Uh, however, we may have implementation out there that are strictly following what is currently in the draft. In other words, there are maybe implementation that when they receive an SR algorithm TLV without algorithm zero inside, they may declare that the nodes that advertise that is not SR capable. So before changing the text, we have to do a little, uh, little check on implementation and be sure we're not going to break things, break more things that we usually break. So uh, that's where we are opinions, flames, or encouragements, or 
So in other words, you sort of want to rename it SR additional algorithm with the assumption that you're not documenting all yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea, yes. Uh, I think there is another slide, but I already explained, yeah. So the, 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 the question is really the backward compatibility uh, impact on this and the next step would be to uh, look for implementations and see if anyone is affected, if there are implementations, if those implementations are being deployed or are planned to be deployed, or if we can safely change them uh, or whatever, or if we have to leave the text as it is because now it's too late. That's also a possibility. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps people from Juniper might have want to look at their implementation uh, for answering that question. <laughs> I'm, I'm bound by all sort of nasty legal contracts, I cannot tell anything. <laughs> David. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so I'm actually, there is a draft hidden in here that shows the ISIS extensions mm -hmm. that go with the framework, but I'm going to walk you through sort of the whole thing so you understand what the ISIS extensions are actually about. Um, if you were in PIM or Spring at this meeting, you can probably do some email for the next 10 minutes um, <laughs> because I've already been around the block. The draft is a framework for computed multicast applied to MPLS-based segment routing. Nice long title, um, but I'm hoping you understand what I'm talking about when I get to the end of it. Next chart, please. So. What this is, is we've posted an 01 draft to the framework. It was originally presented in Buenos Aires, and we've brought forward drafts describing the required IGP extensions. The draft describing ISIS, which is why I'm standing in front of you today, and the draft describing for OSPF, which I'll be presenting on Friday. Next slide. What the draft is about is the application of computing to determining the routing of multicast segments in an MPLS-based segment routing network. And what I mean by computing is, is either the compute engine that's actually in a router on the route processor that does all the dextras, or for example, it could be an external agent uh, that is using SDN or some other mechanism for actually programming the FIB. Um, but the key idea is rather than signaling the multicast trees, we're actually computing them on the basis of information in the IGP. So what the draft describes is the terminology, the approach, it goes into how you would do loose or strictly specified multicast trees, and this also plays into the IGP extensions that I'll be bringing forward a little later in this presentation. Uh, describes the algorithm, and there are some associated FIB installation procedures that go with this. Next chart, please. So what we're talking about is, is we're, creating a, we're taking advantage of the fact that Spring already has a full mesh of unicast tunnels and we're actually using those as a component of multicast tree construction. Because the key thing here is, is through computation of the multicast tree by the control plane, we know where, when we've defined a, an optimal tree by whatever criteria, where the roots, the replication points, and the leaves are, and we can take advantage of spring tunneling to interconnect those. What that means is, is those are the only nodes that need to install state. And this is a fairly significant conservation of state in the forwarding plane. A very simple example would be a tree that had a root and five leaves. Uh, absolute worst case, 10 nodes would need to install state. There would be four replication points, five leaves, and the root. 
This would be irrespective of the network size that that multicast tree happened to span. So you can see there are significant advantages to this in terms of conservation of fib space and also the amount of time it takes to synchronize the control plane and the forwarding database because you've substantially re reduced the amount of state that's going on or that needs to be synchronized. So yeah, you got a bunch of other benefits out of this as well. Um, you have minimal messaging to converge the network. All the state and about multicast was already pre-positioned in the IGP. So when there's a topology change, it is only the messages that communicate the change in topology that are needed such that the network can once again fully reconverge. Um, you know, this is actually fairly straightforward and substantially reduces the amount of control plane traffic. And what's more, it's a virtuous circle. The amount of interrupt of the control plane is dramatically reduced as well. So it can actually get along with the computing part, which is the important aspect of this. Um, we're actually producing minimum cost or near minimum cost trees. So that does reduce the bandwidth requirement in the network to deliver the service in general. Unicast recovery will address most failures because we're using the unicast tunnels. Um, that also means we're able to take advantage of ECMP and get load spreading while doing multicast. So there's some extra advantages there. And finally, the key aspect of this is this is a reuse of the existing MPLS data plane. So this is a control plane change. Uh, and I kind of like it from the point of view that um, control plane complexity to me technology trends tend to be kind to over time because what we're asking the control plane to do is not going to keep going up exponentially while things that affect the data plane like bandwidth will con or make demands on the data plane implementation do continue to go up exponentially. Next chart, please. So the actual algorithm that's described in this, it's a, it's a tree pruning algorithm. Um, and we do this series of steps that's applied to the shortest path tree from the root to the set of leaves. So we initially start with a fully inclusive shortest path tree, and there's a series of prunes that are actually safe and can be applied in any order. And if at the end of those pruning operations, we have fully resolved the tree, which means all leaves have a unique path to the root. AC hey, Lindum, just to be clear, by source, you mean the, so you mean the, the multicast source for source-specific multicast, correct? Yes. Yes, this thing actually constructs either any source multicast out of source rooted trees, or you can do engineered trees um, as, as source rooted trees. So, correct. Um, but it's, so if I have a tree is fully resolved, that if with the safe rules, uh, I have a unique path back to the root, um, and in which case then I know I've produced a minimum cost tree. If uh, then, if I did not get there, that is because I have a situation where the order of any further operations actually matters. Uh, I do sort of a best guess, and, but then I need to audit that tree to make sure it's going to be ECMP friendly and I may need to make a couple of changes. As it turns out, about 97% of the leaves will resolve by the safe rules, so it's only a tiny little bit of checking that you need to do. The other thing is because we are using tunnels, most nodes will decide very early in the process that they are not even going to participate in the tree and can kick out of the computation early. So although this sounds fairly onerous, we've actually produced some quite impressive results and you know, we're getting tractable convergence times in a thousand <coughs> node network. So that, that's actually kind of useful. Next chart, please. Now we have the notion of loose and specified trees. A loose tree is one where the, only the root and the leaves have been specified in the IGP and computation proceeds to fill in the gaps. A specified tree is a concatenated, concatenation of loose trees, which could be specified down to the granularity of a single link. And but what I've actually done is I've simply advertised the set of waypoints that need to be cross-connected across the network. Uh, and the individual nodes can figure out their role in this, whether they're a waypoint, whether they need to do some computation to fill in one of the multicast segments, or whether they need to do nothing. So we have a means of just doing a straight any source multicast, or we have a means of doing engineered pin trees. And this again is all still in a spring context, and is still just using the IGP. Next chart, please. So the IGP changes basically require the specification of three TLVs. 
The first is a capability TLV that says, yes, I can participate in this kind of network and this is the algorithm I'm going to use. I've already gotten feedback suggesting that there are alternative mechanisms to the OUI that might be more acceptable to the community and I'll be looking into that and we'll possibly update the next draft. Um, there is the SID to group binding TLV where I map a multicast group identifier such as a V4 or a V6 multicast address to a segment ID for a multicast segment. Um, and that's how any source multicast is advertised into the IGP. And there's a pin tree descriptor TLV, which basically is a list of nodes that need to participate in the, t in the, the overall hybrid multicast tree and where the pinned waypoints are. Next chart, please. Next chart again, please. So, uh, a little too far. <laughs> uh, back up one more. Oh, I thought you said go to the end. Yeah. Okay, so the, ISI, the, the specifics in the ISIS draft, there is three TLVs, a proposed sub-TLV for TLV 144, where we put the capability and the, uh, the algorithm advertisement. Um, we're using, I think, 6329 as the exemplar, to which I see the group of authors sitting in the back. Um, the multicast group to SID binding TLV, and it's proposed as coming out of the 135, 235, 236, 237 registry, which I'm sure you folks are all much more familiar with than I am, and the pin tree descriptor TLV coming out of the same registry. The actual layout of the TLVs is in the draft. I'm not going to put up a big ASCII description of the TLV here. So ne next chart, please. <clears throat> So in, in essence, what we have is, is this is a proposal that's spanning multiple working groups. Um, it was put into Spring. Spring said PIM should have a look at it. And if it goes forward anywhere, it probably should be PIM. So now it's been introduced in PIM. Uh, I've documented the, uh, o, I, the IGP changes. So with the exception of perhaps some of the interworking aspects with existing multicast networks, which we'll probably bring forward in time, uh, there's a fairly complete solution here for comment and review, so if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it and feed comments. I'm not looking for working group adoption, of course, at this time, because we've just introduced it, and it'll be contingent on PIM deciding to pursue this, but that's the state of things. So with that being said, are there any questions? Uh, you said in one of the slides that you do the Who computation. Are you, Excuse me. Who are you, <laughs> Stefano Previdi, Cisco? Uh, one of the slides you said that all the computation is based on the topology. Yes. Do I understand correctly in saying that everything is confined within a level, within an area? Yes, it's possible to postulate a multi-area solution to this. Uh, that we'd have to bring forward a further draft. But I, I can think of exemplars like the way we did, um, I think it was 7329, SPB, and EVPN working together. But at the moment, yes, it's only described as a single area solution or a single level solution. Any other questions? OK, well, thank you very much. Yeah, so I, we're, sounds like we're about to get a feedback loop, but um, it, it's a sort of interesting. I, I know we, there's been suggestions that ISIS and OSPF should meet together, but I, I've sort of pushed back on that. The, but this is a great example of one where it'd be nice to have maybe one place to present. I don't know. Yeah. Um, do we just pick one, like, <laughs> uh, or do we do it in routing working group? What would it, I don't, does anybody have any thoughts as I look at our AD? <laughs> <laughs> AC Lindem, uh, also OSPF working group chair and Cisco Systems. This, I saw this in, in PIM, uh, not in PIM, in, in uh, Spring Working Group. The target working group is in PIM. The fact, uh, now, what we're, in any case, if we don't 
get it all. You're, you're dependent on people have seen, seen it in a different working group. So in my case, I, in my case, since I hadn't read any of the drafts except the OSPF encoding draft was the only one I had time to read because that was going to be presented in my working group, it was actually good for me to see it twice. Perhaps had I actually read the framework draft prior to spring, it would have been, uh, it would have been better. But now I know exactly what it does. I don't claim to know the details of the tree pruning algorithm from the one, one and a half slide, but you know, you know, be able to envision it. But I, I definitely know what a source specific multicast tree looks, and I, I definitely know what pruning is. But so, I don't know that we need to solve this problem. I mean, you could say, oh, you all saw it in spring. You should be going there. You know, I don't. You know, we have time to we have time to see it again. It's not bad. Oh yeah, us. Um, I think it would be an interesting experiment uh, to have, even if it's a short meeting, a joint one for this and similar, similar to, not this specific draft, because I'm not sure what's going to happen with the work, but in general, um, we've talked about this for a few years now, and it looks to me like the workload, but we can talk offline, might be going in that direction. Um, that's all. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe it's something where we, um, is there any way we can fix that? Uh, you know, it, maybe it's a, a case by case. It's your voice. Oh, yeah, well, I thought it was David's too, so. <laughs> it only started when he got up there. Uh, maybe if I back up. No, not really. Anyway, we could we could look at it from a meeting by meeting case. Uh, but I mean, there, there's, I don't think we really actually have a lot of overlap this time, right? So I, it's hard, kind of hard to tell. And we could maybe do something where we picked, if we did have overlap, we, we could meet in two short separate ones and then a short joint too. Absolutely, I mean, Pim and Mbondi have been meeting back to back for over a year now and I think they found it helpful in terms of encouraging participation and different viewpoints than we're necessarily coming. So I think, you know, it, either meeting back to back in the same room or, and they're scheduling things that are interesting to both appropriately once. Well, and it's up also, to you. I mean, there's also the routing working group or spring or, you know, and we could say, you know, please attend that, that meeting to get the background on this change because you know when I saw this it was like okay well you know there's two slides here that I actually wanted presented in the working group right, right. Uh, but I wanted people to have the background as well so uh. <laughs> I I don't think that the routing working group yeah. is the right solution for everything that touches more than two working groups even though they do of course do an excellent job <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you look at uh, MPLS, TS, and PSAP meeting together, in addition to a separate meeting, it has a lot of value. So. But it shouldn't replace separate meeting. It yeah, I'm, just, I'm worried to, there's not going to be enough even to, 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 to use up the slot, even if it was in a one-hour slot. But <laughs> Sure, but <laughs> scheduling is hard. But for instance, one could have, say, one hour of OS. Sorry, ISIS first, of course, it's ISS. One hour of ISIS, a half hour of joint meeting, one hour of OSPF in a two and a half hour slot, if that were sufficient. Yeah, that's what she just said. <laughs> Let's do the time warp again. <laughs> Hannes Gredler, a uh, technical question on the draft. Oh. I do see that there was no reference to multi topology. Oh being in the draft, is that intentional? Or do you just say, look, uh, this just applies to uh, topology zero? Or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you can do it with multi-topology. Um, I think one of the things is, is that you're going to magnify the computational load, because the starting point is sort of an all-pair shortest path. But, and that's actually only a smaller part of the computation. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing multi-topology, you're going to be proceeding to drive the, the computational load up linearly to converging the network. 
Mm -hmm. So I think it's perfectly viable to do it in the fullness of time. Uh, you know, compute's only going to get more powerful. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to push you to support it, but just uh, uh, perhaps for the ISIS portion of the draft, uh, uh, state uh, that you know that current version is just intended to uh, do topology zero or well we weren't actually intending to put that restriction in so okay. the notion was is that the TLVs that we use would work with a multi topology solution we were just completely agnostic on it okay so from a practical so point of view yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure it's that great an idea but from the pro protocol point of view yes it would be perfectly viable uh, there's still some folks out there who have uh, non-congruent v4 and v6 trees, so... Yeah. Okay, thank you. That would be a perfect option. Yeah. I guess you you already said that your your sub-TLVs are going under the MT sub -T, uh, on MT TLVs. Yeah. So I, I guess that you are supporting MT by yeah. default. Yeah. Okay. So. Ahmed Bashandi, Cisco Systems. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay? Yeah. All right. Thanks, David. Okay. Oh, boy. I think we actually, like, is it the Meet Echo people? Can we ping somebody? Say, hey, we've got a feedback problem. Anybody know? Ever done that? Okay. No. Okay. Wait. Hang on. So, Jeff. yeah, this is Jeff. Jeff's up first. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so short update on uh, maximum seat depth dissimulation information using ISS. Next slide, please. So why <coughs> when a PC or centralized element computes a tunnel, it needs information about what actually supported by hardware. So pushing down label stack, which is deeper than what hardware can support, would have absolutely disastrous consequences. Uh, this information is today missing as part of constraint computation. So why not using PSEP, which can signal, not PSEP requires PSEP session to the node, and it can signal only not MSD. So why, why do we need link MSD? If you look at even single, release of silicon, you might see difference in label depth supported from four to eight labels, just different spins of same silicon. So signaling per link MSD is valuable as well. So there's also similar SPF draft and there are BHPLS extensions to convey this information to the centralized computing element. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so please do not confuse with RLD. There was confusion. RLD as presented entropy label, segment routing, meant for readable depth. It's not the depth of the label stack to be pushed at ingress node. And next slide, please. So it's a sub-TLV, sorry. So RFC 49, 71, I believe. Uh, so sub-TLV code requested from a router capability TLV. Uh, so this is the type, and MSD value from zero to, to 254 would mean the label depth supported. If it's zero, it would mean no label stack could be imposed, so it should not be used. In general, not should advertise the lowest value supported. Next slide, please. So it's 16 bits, but only eight bits. And next slide, please. Okay. So link is to advertise link depth, I can explain. Even on the same device, you might have different line cards which support, which have very different capabilities. So advertised to sub with in uh, 22 into 22. That's all. No, no, I mean, I'll, yes, I'll fix the representation. No, I'll, I'll fix the representation. Uh, next slide. Oh. Uh, I've been contacted by Microsoft and Walmart folks. They want this. They feel they need to know the depth of the stack they're going to push from centralized PC. Um, Les Ginsburg, um, I'm just curious. The your use of zero is not the same as the use of zero in the PSEP draft. PSEP draft says zero 
means there's no limitation. You're saying it means I can't push any labels at all. So, Is that intentional? Uh, I'll discuss with Siva, but in general, you need to be able to signal, please don't try to push any tunnel to me. Okay, but so this, we should end up with a consistent Absolutely. definition. Okay. And we will. So I'm co author of the PCEP draft, so we'll. <laughs> So it's pretty straightforward. So it has been presented in SPF last time. There are some concerns about security. Uh, so we looked into it. I don't really see any security problems by exposing label that supported by devices. So quick question. I actually looked at the draft. When you say link MSD, what does it really mean? The traffic that comes into that link? <clears throat> no. This is the traffic which goes out of a particular interface, which is on particular, which is a silicon particular line card. But, okay, so packet comes in. If you want to send a packet out of this link, make sure that they don't push more than four labels. Now, this is only on ingress node. So this is where you push initial stack. So when you say the link means that traffic, if I, I got an IP traffic coming into that link. Now, this is the impedance encapsulated traffic going out of the node. Okay. This is where you impose, this is egress. What I, what I impose, so when you say link MSD means if the, the traffic that goes out of this link, you yes. cannot push more than four labels or five Exactly, labels. yeah. Okay. Because if it's the ingress router, you would push this label, either split between ingress and egress or on egress. If you cannot push more than particular value, your PC shouldn't compute a tunnel with labels that deeper than one supports it. So, I'm in detail. I'm not sure people, so it really varies how your hardware works. Some hardware pushes on the ingress line card, some hardware pushes on the egress line card. Some hardware will not work if you have this combination of line card. If you want to do, what you're saying here, you're assuming that the pushing happens on the egress line. It card. doesn't really matter. You know the total number of labels you could push, and this is the value you should configure. Okay, I'll talk to you. Sure. It's not as simple as that. Yeah. I've been building routers for a long time, I don't know. So straightforward, I see industry needs this, so I would like to ask for working group adoption. Question. Thank you. Okay, does, uh, does anybody object? Uh, we'll, we'll obviously take this to the mailing list, but uh, does anybody object in the room to uh, adopt this as work? work? No one objects. Do people support it? Is there anyone? Okay, we've got some hands. Okay, good. that's good. So we will take that to the list. Uh, do we have two left? Yep, naming? Yes. Are you sure now? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, you, you just looked at the wrong time, right? I'm, I'm always shuffling these well, things. You, yeah, you yeah, we're we'll keeping you all thrilled and scare <laughs> the best <laughs> for the end, yeah. right? Very yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, is this working? So I'm gonna I switched it around. Let's do the geo first because okay. I think there won't be a lot of. Okay. Oh, well, who knows? Yeah. So uh, naming Sheng with Cisco Systems, and uh, this uh, draft I co-authored with uh, Anker Chen and AC. Next. So uh, geolocation, I uh, presented this uh, last ITF in the OSPF. Uh, basically, the format is uh, identical, and the, the reasoning also listed on this uh, particular slide is the same uh, I took from that uh, slide. Uh, so basically, there's uh, uh, several interesting cases one is in uh, overlay cases, and you have a tunnel going to remote sites, and you are IGP uh, as the routing within your own VPN. And uh, one of the cases, how do you go out on uh, optimal DMZ uh, exit points? You know, uh, uh, you can do your own. Uh, uh, guess, uh, or you can search for next hop, you can, but this gives you a mechanism to uh, automatically know where is your closest uh, exit point. Uh, 
uh, this is uh, when we did for the BGP in particular, uh, but for the OSPF and the ISIS, and we had this uh, uh, P2MP uh, links uh, coming up, and you can use that information uh, to help to derive your uh, outbound metrics towards the remote endpoints uh, automatically instead of using some kind of a manually figured out uh, metric for the P2MP uh, connections. Uh, so, uh, yeah, all the other things, you know, uh, uh, like we talked about, you can find your own device uh, if it's on the telephone telephone pool uh, outside, uh, you will know the exact location, uh, how to service this, uh, and the network topology maps, uh, because more and more people are doing the controller and those GUI interface, and this gives you uh, some kind of automated way to position your device onto your GUI interface. You know, all those things. Uh, so. Uh, I don't want to list all those things, but uh, next. So this is the uh, basic TLV uh, we are talking about called geolocation TLV, and it gives you the altitudes and the longitudes and the uh, latitudes, and uh, this is massaged from the aircraft draft from the list. And uh, and uh, if you look at that draft and the less and the others also commented on that aircraft draft, the uh, resolution is like a, a minimum is 31 meter or something like that because it's count for the degree. Uh, and a lot of people think this is not sufficient uh, to to represent in general or future proof. So we change the format in the way, and we do the milliseconds, and that comes down right now uh, for the latitude and the longitude. Uh, it comes down to like uh, two and a half and uh, three point three uh, centimeters. So this is the resolution. We think it's good enough for even for small devices or fully packed uh, data center uh, switches, you know, all those usages. Obviously, you don't want to use automatic learning for those things in the data center, that kind of environment. You can have the uh, operators to, to collect the data center general geolocation four points, and you can have them to divide based on where the bay, you know, uh, uh, location area, uh, your exact switch is. So you know exactly when you use an iPhone app or walking down, you probably can find this device uh, nearby, uh, that kind of thing. Now, there is an interesting thing is uh, we added this uh, uncertainty uh, bits. This is a 60, uh, 16 bits value. So we currently, because our resolution right now is a centimeter, that kind of level, so we put this uh, uncertainty resolution uh, to be the centimeter. But we just talked to Dino uh, this morning, and uh, he has some different idea, little different idea of the usage, a similar meaning of this, but it's a different application. He called this as a geo prefix. What geo prefix does is you know the center and you know the radius and you know all those devices around this region. Let's say uh, Berlin. You know the center of the Berlin has the geolocation points to you and you give it uh, a radius of 10 miles, say for example. Uh, and you can advertise, say, for example, a prefix saying that slash 24 only allowed within this particular region. Uh, 
or you want to be a uh, privacy sensitive you say uh, I actually do not want to tell you exactly where I am although the resolution is up to uh, two centimeters I want to be offset by 600 meters or two miles or something like that so you can use this field uh, so because the way we are using this we are doing this in centimeter so the maximum uh, the maximum number you can get is 600 meters something but his field is also 16 bits but he his thing is kilometers so he can circle around the earth twice for that 16 bits so we need to uh, talk about, to consolidate about how this field is going to be represented. But, but that's, the, that's the controversial portion so far, yeah. Uh, the altitude is a very large number. We can have a centimeter or meters. So the maximum number will be five times to the distance of the moon. We think it should be good enough for, you know, if you are, over that, it shouldn't be geo, right? It should be some somewhere else. Yeah. Is it so? Uh, yeah. Is one of those flags indicating like centimeter versus? Yes. Yeah, so okay. one of the flag is uh, indicated that uh, altitude is centimeter or meters. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi. Well, yeah, let's just have you talked to anybody in art who's actually looked at how to do privacy around location? Uh, no. Uh, Send me a pointer, please. I'll cut you in touch with the art ADs. Okay. So, so I also have a, a. I don't know if you. Yeah. Are you imagining routers um, being able to know this, like, kind of like our iPhones do, or? or... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yes or no? Uh, yes is more and the more even the switches and the routers do have their LTE interface, you know, all those things. Uh, we can't uh, probably use those things to help in the future. Or uh, easiest way is you get a location of the address, you know, uh, doing some conversion and put some configuration into the local device. Right, for find my router, find my router. That doesn't work, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, when you put in, I assume you put in the real location, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even you uh, jitter this for two miles, but you probably should jitter all the devices in the same way and also tell your iPhone you have jittered that much, you know, so uh, privately you can still find it. Uh, <laughs> Lost my CRS. Yeah, no. Or actually, the, I mean, I was thinking of the case where um, you get some kind of ticket in your in your network, and you're dispatching a, a you know field guy to go plug a fiber in somewhere, right? Right. I don't know. Okay. Right. Um, one question. Um, you mentioned that you want to constrain things to particular prefixes. Uh, as I read the encodings today, it applies to the node, right? It, Not it, to the prefix. Uh, well, this one is a TLV. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, in iSize and OSPF advertisements, we advertise a router uh, with this a a TLV. Yeah. yeah, it is a node. But in a BGP case, there's no such a thing as a node. It's everything is a prefix, you know, all those things. So it could be a prefix slash 30 or 24 to have a different uh, radius or something like that. Yeah. yeah Julian Luchek from Juniper. A couple of points. So first of all, in the draft, it mentioned about acquiring the GPS coordinates dynamically from a actual GPS receiver. So obviously, Implementation-wise, somebody would have to put smoothing. You don't want it shifting around by two centimeters due to atmospheric conditions, and you know, triggering a new, um, you know, ISIS update. So that's one point. Um, the other thing is, um, have you or others looked into um, exporting this info in BGPLS? Because the obvious thing is that you've got a BGPLS speaker, which is 
you know, receiving all this information in for all the nodes in the ISIS topology, then it wants to export it um, on the BGPLS session to a central controller so that the controller in its GUI, if it's got a GUI, can put all the nodes in there in a correct geographical, you know, relative representation. Right. Uh, well, if I understand this one, uh, uh, if we need <coughs> it, this thing can be exported to the BGPLS so it can use BGP infrastructure to upload it to the northbound. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Then the, uh, whatever the mapping services, what I'm talking about, actually can use such a service, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So is anyone looking at the BGPLS side? Uh, I, I don't know okay. anybody. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So was, it, was your first question uh, regarding um, if, if you had a, a GPS on the router, that uh, we might have to consider the movement or jitter of the region yes. so that it would keep flooding. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. the draft says, um, you know, the coordinates could either be statically, you know, configured mm -hmm. in the CLI or could right. be acquired dynamically. If it's dynamically, you know, you don't want right, right, right. one millimeter shift yeah, yeah. triggering a, you know, ISIS update. Thanks. Yeah, still in the same question about the GPLS, uh, the consumer of this information is it really a yes, a yes, or an a yes, a yes node? Because we tend to say that in BGPLS, we uh, advertise information that has been originated somewhere else. But in fact, in BGPLS, you can originate information directly. So have you ever thought about originating this directly into BGPLS without going through an IGP? Uh, but, but we do have the BGP uh, information also, right? The BGP can't announce in, that's fine. The, right. the, the question that, is, do you really need to originate it in ISIS, then redistribute it into BGPLS just to feed a controller somewhere? Can't you just originate it into BGPLS just to feed the controller? So do you what? really need this information in ISIS? No, I don't think uh, for the controller depends on if the controller is using BGPLS or not, right? If the controller is using BGPLS, then this probably will be a natural way to convey this one. Otherwise, we can use any other mechanism. Uh, I'm not sure we have to put into the BGPLS, but... Uh, uh, naming, yeah. I just, naming, well, one, one second. Naming, I just want you to know that you're less than eight minutes left for your spine leap. I'm, I'm just gonna say that quick, quick let's, not, let's not talk about AC Lindum. We will add the, uh, a BGPLS, uh, TLV to the BGP draft, and in that way, it could be it could be advertised from in an agnostic way from any protocol. So does so draft already. So, so we don't the, want we don't want anybody to write a draft just for this parameter. Did it's just be BGPLS? AC, did I understand you correct that in that BGP draft you're also asking for a BGPLS code point Not yet. for that? Not yet, but you will. Yes. Okay. Robert Sashok. So this is a little bit related to Hannah's question. Um, not about BGPLS, but if you redistribute ISIS to BGP, which location do you actually apply? The one who redistributes or the one who originates? No, no. If it is uh, imported into BGPLS, no, 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 not related to BGPLS at all. Oh, okay. Just routing wise. If I redistribute ISIS to BGP at some point, right. and I want to apply location, right? The draft may be made clear that this is not the redistribution point, but the originator, right? But this draft is specific for ISIS, right? But I can redistribute the, ISIS to BGP. Yes, uh, then the BGP draft will decide uh, to tag this one as an inbound, yes. uh, and it's import as an AS. So, let's get through, but yeah. you're not proposing to tie this to a prefix advertisement, right. correct? No, not for the so ISIS. Not for the distribution does not right. apply. Okay, and how do you then think about multi-area operation? Is there a plan to sort of leak uh, the prefix uh, that represents uh, a router along with that information across area boundaries, or should we just do it on BGPLS as Stefano has proposed? I would think in that case you it's uh, this information 
I would think is uh, is associated with the next hub, right? With the loopback. Yeah. With the loopback address that is carried in inside the RGP, so then BGP is doing the recursion. So that's why, you know, when you have RGPs running and uh, that's accessible, it makes sense for RGPs to carry in this information instead of RBGPs, <clears throat> right? Well, I think it would help me everyone, right? Hmm? The carry BGP in the The inter-AS, in that case, yes, on the, on the ASPRs, you do some, you definitely, yeah. There's the interaction. Naming, I'm leaving so, this up for you whenever you want to cut. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's put uh, this onto the mailing list. Uh, yeah. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, this is the spine leaf extension, and I co authored, okay, I co authored with uh, SenJT of Cisco Systems. Next. And uh, so in data center, you have those uh, basic two layer of things and uh, there's an aggregation layer and uh, there is uh, uh, what do you call access layer. So it's a spine and the leaf, usually the leaves connect to a lot of spine nodes. And even you know the full topology information, sometimes it doesn't help, but you have to go through the spine in order to reach the other leaves or go northbound if the spine is connecting to the northbound routers. And uh, so this proposal is saying uh, uh, for a lot of uh, scalability issues of fully meshing, you know, uh, you have way to cut down. And also for those leave nodes, sometimes it's a very small device, resource limited. So you don't want them to have the full database and this is the this is the proposal uh, next. And so we say we add one TLV, and this TLV is only present onto the ISS Hello. And uh, there's uh, only three flags currently. Mainly two of them is used for this purpose. One is the leave. If you want to decide that you are the leave, there's a configuration say you are the leave. And when you send out your hello and you set this L bit, you tell the upper, upper link of the spine node saying, I'm the leaf, and the, the, the spine look at this saying, hey, I'm, I'm order, ordering this one. When it's sending back the hello, it will set the R bit uh, using the same uh, TLV, and uh, that way uh, uh, the, the leaf sees this R bit and of all the spine nodes, and you can just uh, set a default route. You don't even need to run SPF, you know. Uh, so this is basically uh, ECMP, all those things. But we do offer a 32 bit uh, metric. You can push this one from the spine nodes back to the leaf nodes, saying how confident I am you should use me as a default route, right? Say I suddenly lost two leaves and I probably want to increase my metric while the other leaves are uh, still fine. They are setting the default metric 10, say for example. So there's a less chance for uh, packets going to those two leaves to be rerouted, right? Uh, so next. Uh, so this is basically just to uh, illustrate the idea. On the top, there's two uh, spine nodes and a full eye size operation, no difference. At the bottom, there's a three leaf nodes, and they only have their own uh, LSP. So uh, from the left side, we send a hello up saying we are the leaf node. On the right side, there's a direction sending down saying, uh, you are okay to use me as a default route. So for those leave nodes, uh, they just uh, need to figure out how many default uplink nodes we have and install, install the default routes into the table with the proper metrics. Uh, next. So this is we define only for the point-to-point -point link and it doesn't apply for the point-to-multipoints. And uh, we are saying 
uh, even though usually there's a two layers, you could have another core layer on top of that. Uh, and uh, for point-to-point -point link, uh, CSNMP is uh, optional. So we don't recommend to run this through this link. And uh, also we allow leave node to leave node next adjacent to leave nodes to exchange. Yeah, Tony. No, I wait. I, I will oh, okay. in the queue. I'm Kim. Okay. <laughs> so we want the leave to set the overload a bit because the leave always upload their uh, LSP database to the spine to the spine, and you don't want them to come down the traffic, come back because I don't really know where to uh, forward them correctly. It can cause routing load if the spine use me as a transit. Uh, and uh, this is just one exception. Uh, the host name usually is on the LSP, but in this time, the lead nodes does not receive LSP from anywhere. So the host, the spine nodes may send down uh, the uh, host name through the hello. Uh, so we open uh, this particular TLV can be in IH and uh, and uh, the default metric I just described. Yeah, so I'm by Yeah, it, I mean, if you, uh, it, the next, there's a 20 minute break, but. Uh, oh, okay. But I mean, if, I think we should probably make any comments on this. And, right, right, like, right. Wrap it up. Tony. Uh, Tony P. Uh, very cool, seriously. Huh? Um, two observations, and it's more like, um, Nothing is wrong with it. It may uh, be wider applicable. Uh, did you look at RPL and the ranking? How they do that? RPL. Uh, RPL is the ripple. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Whatever they call it. Yeah. So. No, I didn't really compare. Those worth solutions. worth looking at it because they do like dynamic ranking. There may be something to be pimped here out of the ranking okay. in case you go more layers okay. or a node may decide to have more information right, and right. just lower a rank. Right. Just a good idea. Okay. The other thing. Um, so what link state is missing, right, for the data center guys like these exceptions, I want to shove the flow somewhere. So you have this default route thing, but it's like shove everything. So maybe with this default route, we could include a list of prefix exception with the metric. And that way they could shove only part of the traffic like they're doing it with BGP. Oh, where do you shuffle the... With, uh, the on the hello, right there. But uh, the oh, hollow has some limitations. Think right? through it. I, it's not a full okay. solution, but I'm thinking okay. that on top of think the default, about that. if we can yeah. steer the flow, yeah. all of a sudden we have a pretty Basically, you are saying advertise some exceptions. Basically, build a lightweight BGP on top. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, Hannes Gredler, uh, just some feedback. Uh, I mean, the problem uh, of, you know, sparse connected nodes uh, is not new, right? It first occurred usually in metro rings. And uh, what people actually have done in some implementation is adding support for multiple L1 link state databases and sort of scope uh, that to... Uh, uh, appear, appear there is a draft for the multi-instance also, right? Right, 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 uh, right. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just yeah, that's another I'm, approach. I'm, I'm yeah. just asking yes. why cannot it done with existing mechanisms? Uh, well, uh, the existing mechanism basically you blow up all the all the adjacencies or layer ones. Uh, the, the, I, I don't think that the layer one here is applicable. If you if you have a full uh, spine in the leaf uh, or clause network, right? Yeah. This is fine because you are always connecting to all the spines, right? Yeah. But but uh, the the problem I'm describing here is a more general uh, uh, data center or campus. Uh, all the leaves may not be connected to all the spines. Uh, then you may be connecting to a subset of the spines ah, here so and there, you're, you're... but there on the second layer, they are somehow connected through the spine layer, or they are connected through another core layer. So you have that connection. So to do the layer, layer one thing is uh, is a problem. Uh, you're so, correct. So, if so, it's so a you want to select clause. things essentially. Yes. yes. If you okay. perfect the clause, you're correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So I, I, I'll just throw out quick. I, I went through the draft. I 
think you're going to get into trouble when you started having the uh, leaf to leaf routing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, I, I, I think I found a couple of routing loops there. But, okay. Or it was either that or the combination of also being able to tell the leaf. I the think default, this is coming from method. somebody had a data center specific implementation. They were saying customer have to have this thing. So this is what we put into this one. Yeah, we can discuss this. Yeah. Why don't you send the... the Yo, uh, I have a lot of comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Jean Marie, uh, again, adding another thing that this thing rings a bell about. Uh, I think Trill has also a mechanism similar to this. Uh, Trill is, relies mainly on ISAS too. Right. And I see they have a kind of hello protocol, which looks to have some overlap with this. Okay. So on I'll top of raw, thing, you may also yeah, yeah. have interest to look at this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Th thanks, naming. Thank uh, that, that's our last presentation. We were five minutes over. Thanks for everybody staying. And two. Yes. And it never fed back again. They were testing in the other room. Oh, is that what it was? That, that is what it was. Ah. I, by the way, I didn't, I didn't mean, you know, when I was like, I wasn't telling you to go run after him. No, 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 no. I was saying, I can't believe he's leaving. Yeah. Right? No, he was just checking things and then figuring out it's because of, you know, they're sitting up to the big plenary uh, and they are actually doing tests. In